a special presentation jointly sponsored by the Child Health Research Center and the iThrive CTSA. Um, I think it's safe to say that our speaker today, Dr. Brian Nosick, um, is uh, not just a visionary, but um, an evangelist who is uh, who travels around and spreads the gospel of open science. Um, I hope that you become believers at the end of today's talk, but um, he will be giving the the uh, CHRC seminar um, in this room for the next um, hour or so, and then we will actually repair to uh, conference room B in the Education Research Center afterwards for anybody who wants to um, join us. I think we will have extra cookies um, in, in that venue. And we'll just, we'll have a, a very informal um, give and take about the concept of open science and perhaps what um, reservations that you might have, what, what impediments, obstacles, and hoping to overcome them. So, um, so the formal introduction, Dr. Brian Nosek is co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science that operates the OSF, a collaborative management service for registering studies and archiving and sharing research materials and data. The Center for Open Science is enabling open and reproducible research practices worldwide. Brian is also a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. He received his PhD from Yale University in 2002. He co-founded Project Implicit, a multi-university collaboration for research and education investigating implicit cognition, which is thoughts and feelings that occur outside of awareness or control. Brian investigates the, investigates the gap between values and practices such as when behavior is influenced by factors other than one's intentions and goals. Research applications of this interest include implicit bias, decision-making, attitudes, ideology, morality, innovation, barriers to change, open science, and reproducibility. Um, among many other um, awards and accolades, in 2015, he was named one of Nature, as in the journal, Nature's 10 people who matter. That's a pretty cool distinction. <laughs> One of the, ten, and the rest of us don't matter, I guess, but the 10 <laughs> mattered in that particular year. Um, and it also has been, uh, been listed in the Chronicle for Higher Education Influence, Influence List. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce for the special seminar, Dr. Brian Nozick. Thanks. Thanks very much for coming. I'm delighted uh, to be able to speak with you today. Uh, as Jim mentioned, my uh, laboratory interest is in the gap between values and practices, what we think we should do, what we want to do, what we're trying to do versus what we actually do in our everyday behavior. And most of the work uh, that we have done uh, in, uh, in the basic research is on how it is we end up behaving in ways that are counter to our values uh, because of influences that we may not even be aware that we're applying. Uh, reasoning, cognitive biases, implicit biases that may shape things that might be in our self-interest, but not in our uh, values or uh, intentional interests. The Center for Open Science spun out uh, from my lab in 2013 uh, as a practical application of that research interest, which is the gap between scientific values and scientific practices. How we idealize science to operate, how we think it should operate in order to maximize the pace and confidence of the uh, discoveries that we make uh, versus how it is we've constructed a research culture that doesn't necessarily incentivize and reinforce the things that are aligned with the values of scholarship. And what our aim is, is changing that research culture to align what is the norms and incentives and policies governing how uh, science works uh, to the values that we have for how we think science should work. So what I'd like to do today is introduce you basically to how it is we conceive of the challenge uh, for what the research culture incentivizes, particularly the academic research culture, uh, and then uh, our theory of change model for shifting that research culture, and then some illustrations of some of the interventions that we've been pursuing uh, at different parts of the research uh, life cycle and among different stakeholders to try to make those shifts occur. So I'll be happy for a discussion about any of these uh, issues. But let me start with values. If we're going to talk about what is it the values that we have for scholarship or for science, then we should articulate some. And a great one from my perspective is Merton's norms that he identified in the 1940s and 50s for how he thought 
uh, scientific pursuits distinguish themselves from other ways that we learn things about the world. So one of his norms, as he identified them, is communality, the open sharing of information. When I make a scientific claim, you don't believe it just because I said so. You come to believe it or not based on being able to see the methodology that I used uh, to generate the evidence for that claim, the data that got generated from that methodology, the inference process that I applied to that data to decide what it is that I claim uh, to have learned uh, from that versus the counter norm of, please just trust me. That's what I found, we, we did it, don't worry, just trust me. A second norm from Merton was universalism. Research is evaluated based on its own merit. It's the evidence itself and the quality of that evidence that determines whether it's trustworthy or credible versus the counter norm of particularism. Ah, she's famous, it must be true, let's just go with it. Right? Another norm of disinterestedness. Researchers are motivated by knowledge and discovery just trying to figure out how things work, versus self-interest it is. Really, I'm in it so that I get the job and you don't. And I'm gonna do things in a career interest uh, that will help me uh, to advance my career in a competitive marketplace uh, for the limited number of jobs, grants, opportunities, et cetera. And then organized skepticism. A researcher considers all new evidence even against their prior work, versus organized dogmatism. I complete my dissertation and then spend the rest of my career defending it against everyone who's trying to attack and undermine the findings that I found. And while Merton didn't talk about it, there is a commonly discussed norm of quality versus a counter norm of quantity. Right? Do really good work or do a lot of it. All right, so when I look at those and recognize them as norms that have been identified as ways that we think of uh, science operating versus other ways of operating, but an obvious question is whether researchers themselves endorse those norms compared to the counter norms. And Anderson and her colleagues asked. They did about a survey of about 3,300 NIH awardees. Early career for them were researchers in a postdoctoral award. Mid-career were researchers that were in a, their first R01 award. So average age at this time was about 40 uh, for that uh, sample. And what you're seeing here is a cumulative plot uh, of their responses of which do they endorse, the norms or the counter norms. And in gray are people who endorse the norms over the counter norms on average, about 90% of the sample. In black are those that said that they, no, no, they think science should operate based on the counter norms, not the norms, right? almost nobody. Uh, and then the gray hatches are people who said about equal weight between these two things, should be how science works. So they said, okay, that's great, that's fine. Don't tell me what you endorse, tell me how you behave. What do you do in your everyday work? And it looks like this. Right, so still about 60% of respondents are saying that they behave according to the norms of science over the counter norms, but an increasing proportion are saying that those counter norms also have influence on their behavior. Still very few are saying that they behave according to the counter norms over the norms. So they say, okay, that's fine, that's great, thank you for that. Don't tell me what you do, tell me what the other people in your discipline, what do they do? And it looks like this. <laughs> Right. So this is the culture problem. Nearly everyone agrees that those norms of how scholarship should work are how scholarship should work. Most people report that they're trying to behave by those norms, but many acknowledge that those self-interested activities are things that have some influence on their behavior. And even though it's the same people, we don't perceive the people around us to be behaving by those norms. That's the culture problem. It's all the same people, and yet we perceive that the culture reinforces those behaviors that are more about self-interest than about what's in science's interest. And what this creates is a difficult situation for anyone deciding how is it that they are going to act. Because if I am trying to make a career out of science, I can say, well, these are the values that I have. This is how I think science should work. This is how I think I should do my science. And if I make that choice, is that's how I'm going to behave because those are my values, then I'm doing so with this recognition that that is not what, what is rewarded. That in fact, I will disadvantage myself in my career advancement by doing science the way I think it should be done. Or I could say, I need a job. I need the grant. I need the publication. So I need to do the things that will get me that, that sacrifice my alignment with what I think is how science should be done in the first place. 
And that is a dysfunctional culture because it requires us to make a trade-off decision between what we think we should be doing versus what we actually do to survive and thrive uh, in that culture. And so if we're to make, if we're to address the dysfunctional cultural elements, what we will end up doing is getting these aligned, where the values that people have, they perceive as what are being re reinforced in how the culture operates. So there are many ways that we can characterize what are those dysfunctional elements of the research culture, uh, particularly in academics, uh, that create this gap. Uh, and, it's, and it's not simple. There's lots of different factors at play. But for us, it really boils down uh, to this as a key item, which is that the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. My career advancement is advantaged by publishing as frequently as I can in the most prestigious outlets that I can. And of course, I want to get it right. I didn't get into science to write papers and grants. I got into science to figure things out, to discover things, to solve some of the problems that are most interest to me, whatever. But nevertheless, there are concrete rewards that I have to face in how it is I pr prioritize the work that I do and how I, is, how I do that work. And I know that some of the things that we do in our research make those findings that we get more publishable than other things. Right? We know that not everything gets published. It's not just a matter of doing good work. It's a matter of doing good work that provides publishable units. And what are publishable units? Well, you're more likely to get published by finding a positive result than a negative result. This treatment's effective versus it's not. These things are related versus they're not. It's more likely to get published if you find a novel result, something no one's observed before, rather than reinforcing evidence or challenging evidence of stuff that's already been claimed. Right? More likely to get a publication if all of the evidence is tidy, fits together, and reinforces a central conclusion or a general explanation, rather than evidence that has exceptions, things that don't quite fit, parts that aren't quite there. Right? So a novel, positive, tidy story is the best kind of story in science because it's the best story in science. If you discover something new, provide good evidence for it, and have a clear, complete explanation for all of that evidence, you've done something amazing, which has broken new ground in how science operates and what we understand about the world. But of course, that, do that doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very often because we're studying hard things. That's why we're studying them. And the progress that we make is slow and incomplete and has lots of dead ends and things that don't quite fit and understanding that emerges over many, many, many trials, research topics, programs of research, people. So the insights where we ultimately end up with a story that is comprehensive and compelling is not on a timeline or on a scale that fits into papers. It's on a time scale that fits into the narrative arc of programs of research. But each paper is incentivized to achieve that each time. And the challenge that we have is that at every stage of the research life cycle, there are different things that I can do that will make my research look more like that ideal at the cost of its credibility. So for example, we do many experiments in my lab. We only publish a subset of them. What's the selection process that we go through to decide which ones of those experiments go into the paper and which ones are left out? If it's a negative result, we might very easily come up with a rationalization of, ah, the methodology we used there was bad. Just ignore that study. It's a bad study. We shouldn't have done that. I don't know why we did that study. That's a ridiculous study. Right? So we put it aside. Whereas the one that has a positive result, of course it's a good study. I got the result I expected. Right? So there's lots of occasions where I may deploy lots of seemingly reasons, but potentially rationalizations that are dealing with the fact that I have a conflict of interest in that decision. What's good for me and what's good for science may not be the same thing. Right? We can analyze our results in many different ways. And those decisions about how we analyze the data have implications for what we observe uh, as the statistical inferences at the end. If I'm confronted with multiple choice points of different exclusion rules, different ways of transforming the data, uh, different model functions, and some of them look better for publication versus not, 
it's very easy to see that I might start to rationalize that the one that looks best is the right way to analyze the data compared to the alternatives. So because we have skin in the game, it's very hard for us to necessarily see that the decisions that we're making may be done in self-interest as opposed to interest in the maximizing the accuracy and the outcomes. And so there is a now a large literature uh, of meta-science that's examining the credibility of the published literature uh, that finds that a published result is not as reproducible as we might presume based on the fact that it is published, that it has been peer reviewed, that it is ostensibly supported by multiple lines of evidence. That in fact, we may have lots of the behaviors that occur at different stages of the life cycle that are challenging the credibility of the underlying claims uh, that are present uh, in those papers at the end. So <clears throat> there's lots of <clears throat> Uh, potential interventions uh, that we might consider for how it is we can address that as the core challenge. And for us, the basic things to change are the transparency of the process and of the outputs of the research. We don't have to be highly prescriptive on how researchers do their research because research is done in lots of different ways that are productive for trying to figure things out. But if we can't see how it is, if you can't see how it is I arrived at the claims I arrived at, if all you have is access to the paper, which is my characterization of how it is we arrived at those claims, then you can't actually evaluate that evidence to credibly assess whether it's credible or not. David Donahoe at Stanford likes to call the paper advertising for the research, not the research. Right? If we want the self-corrective processes in science to work, then we need to actually have access to the evidence base uh, that will allow people to assess the quality of that evidence. Yeah, question. In this whole process, can you comment on the strong emphasis that's put on having a hypothesis to submit a grant or a paper? Yeah. Meaning, if you're too wedded to your own hypothesis or there's a conflict of interest, there is an alternative to say that you're going to do this experiment because there are important gaps. Yeah. And the answer is this is what we want to learn. Yeah. And you can shape what your belief is. But the emphasis on hypotheses over the years where your grants and papers can get turned down if you don't have a hypothesis kind of stimulates a culture that is a problem. Yeah, yeah. So that if you didn't hear it in the back, the question is what role is the emphasis on having to have a hypothesis in the grant at the front uh, matter of the paper or otherwise? Potent playing a role in this to some degree. And I think you're exactly right, is we have this uh, enculturated notion that what we need to show you as the reader of my paper is how brilliant I was before we had the evidence, <laughs> right? I knew all of this was gonna happen in exactly this way, and this is why I thought it was gonna happen in all of that way, and here's the evidence to show I was right. So when you do reviews of papers, uh, and look at how often is the hypothesis that's presented at the beginning of the paper supported at the end. The rates are at 90%. We are all right all of the time. And if that's really true, then we don't need to do the research. Because we already know the answers. Why do the research? It's not true, and that's the problem, right? Is a lot of it is harking. This may not be a familiar term to everyone here. This came out of uh, a paper in, the, uh, in psychology, hypothesizing after the results are known. Uh, and the idea is you see the finding, you see the data, and you say, How, let's make sense of that. And of course we're going to generate hypotheses. We should be generating hypotheses. We're confronted with evidence we don't understand. We're going to try to figure out why it might have occurred. But then when we write the paper or when we write the grant, what we write is, and of course our theory anticipates these kinds of outcomes in this way, and look, the data came out that way rather than just transparently saying, we had no idea this was going to occur. This is a total surprise. And here are some ways that we might, we've generated some hypotheses to try to explain it. But really, what we need to do is now test those hypotheses. The evidence that we have now isn't a test of them. It, spawned, it provided the basis for the exploratory result, the discovery, rather than the explanation. Yeah, please. What you say is Done the research. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. To, to fit, that your day would fit, and your paper fits what you said you were going to show. Yeah. And it may not, it may, it, that, you get biased. That's right. And the, so if we have to show that we already know what's going to happen, then it really undermines the whole process of doing the research in the first place, which is exactly as, as you noted, it's to ask a question. Ask it a question about an important thing. And it should be okay to have no idea what, how it might turn out. But we know that we need to know the answer. Now it's great, we want hypothesis testing work and, it, and to foster research where a theory does have some specific uh, questions that are, or hypotheses that need to be tested. But a lot of what we do is really at that frontier where we just sort of have a hunch or an intuition or no real idea. Or maybe we just have a question. We say, well, it'd be interesting to look at this. And we don't incentivize that in the way of how it is we enforce the work. And so we force that discovery work into a mode, a model, uh, that requires us presenting it in a way as if we had known it all along. Was there another question or hand? Yeah, please. Yes, so the, right, so the journals are, are creating this challenge because this is what they ask for, present it in this way. So, of course, what am I gonna do? And I tell them I didn't do that way, that way, and then they'll say, okay, that's great, go to a different journal, right? So this is where that culture and incentives really starts to create some challenges. So we'll get to some interventions that try to tackle that directly uh, in the next part. Was there another question just before I move on? Okay. All right, so that's what I want to say about the problem. So this is the theory of change uh, slide that we operate on. Uh, and how is it if we want to shift the culture towards greater transparency and ultimately greater credibility and reproducibility, what needs to change? And we want to promote the behaviors of more openness of the process of research, what studies were done, let's at least be able to know what they were done, whether they end up in the paper or not, and what the outputs of the research, the data, the materials, the protocols, the reagents, et cetera. So the base model is, is, can be organized by this uh, pyramid, not because you can't start the things at the top uh, before the other things, but rather the success of the things at the top depend on successful implementation of things lower. So the basic idea is this. If we want people to adopt new behaviors of transparency, you have to have tools, infrastructure, that makes it possible for them to do those behaviors. It's not sufficient to just have the behavior, the tools available for most people because we're busy. There's a lot of things we need to do. So if we're going to get people to adopt those behaviors, you have to pay attention to their workflows. How is it that those researchers do their work and integrate with those workflows effectively so that it's not adding on a whole extra set of things to do to be more transparent, but rather just part of the process that they're doing already. Make it easy. That is technology. Everything else is social. So most of how researchers decide how am I supposed to behave is based on looking at people around us. Right? Science is decentralized, but we have lots of local communities of what are the right ways to do research. And we learn that by observing our colleagues and our local peers within our subdisciplinary areas. And so norms play a big role. Descriptive norms, this is just what people do in our field, this is how it's done. And prescriptive norms, this is what we say is how we should be doing things. And so any change model has to incorporate shifting of those norms, of making visible when people are doing these new behaviors so that it's easier for others to do that. And then of course we can't not pay attention to the incentives. If we say, oh, these are good things to do, we have all of these ideals, we, we think we should do it this way, but we reward something totally different, we are not going to get people's behavior to change because when confronted between idealism and have a job, it's not a very hard choice for most people, right? And then finally, of course, you can make, make things required, right? Do you want the money? I want the money. You gotta do this thing. Uh, I don't wanna do this thing. Do you want the money? I want the money. You gotta do this thing. Okay, I'll do the thing. Right? So that's in big picture uh, how uh, we think about this. But that's uh, in a very abstract description. What we can also think about is what we've learned from diffusion of innovations in technology and other kinds of adoption of new behaviors. So this is a classic model from Rogers in the 1960s where the term early adopters was generated. And the whole idea of these models of diffusing, diffusing new innovations is that there are different motivations at, among individuals who adopt at different stages of the life cycle of a new technology. 
right? Someone who is at the front end when a new technology comes out, an innovator early adopter, is motivated by the behavior itself, right? They're excited about the new thing because it's a new thing. And so they might be willing to try that behavior and do it for reasons that are different than someone who is in the mainstream, who is after that behavior has been tested may have different reasons that they think about why they would adopt it. So you can think about this adoption curve where you have early adopters sort of being a testing ground before it gets into mainstream and then people resisting until they last possibly can. Think about that curve and rotate it on top of the pyramid that I showed you on the last slide. And this sort of helps to articulate what that theory of change model is. Right? So the innovators, the people who all you need to do is make something possible because they want to try it. They're excited about the new thing. Providing the technology is sufficient for them to adopt the new behavior. They're willing to tolerate the bugs and the things that don't quite work or the fact that it doesn't have any relevance uh, to the current reward system because they're motivated by the technology and the behavior itself. Right? Likewise with those early adopters, making it easy for their workflows, they're interested in the vision of being more transparent. They like the idea of improving the reproducibility of their work. They don't care that others aren't doing it. They don't care uh, that it's not rewarded. They're motivated by the behavior itself. For getting full scale culture change, these early adopters are critical for getting over the chasm to the mainstream. And the way that they're critical is to make visible when they are doing those behaviors. Right? The challenge with norms is that Something like sharing data, someone will say, oh, people don't share data in my field. That's not a thing that we do. I never see other people doing it. If we can increase the visibility of those early adopters that are sharing data, then it provides information for those people in the mainstream to say, oh, I see that people are doing that now. Maybe that's a thing that we do now. And so you can start to shift norms by increasing the visibility of when those behaviors are occurring so that as you increase the likelihood that some will do it. And what the great thing about norms is that they're compounding interest, right? The more likely that those people do it, then the more likely the next people are to do it, because now more people are doing it. And now more people are doing it, so the more likely the next do it. But that, of course, is not sufficient for everyone, because if those incentives are not there, then all the norms in the world will still disadvantage those behaving by the norms if they're not rewarded uh, for those behaviors. And so incentives are key for full mainstream. And of course, there's always the laggards who won't do it because they just have been doing it this way for 40 years, damn it, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but if you make it required and they have to do it, then they'll do it. Okay, so that's the base idea of how we approach this. And what I want to do is give some examples of how we try to support each of these different uh, parts of the pyramid uh, for this adoption uh, curve for culture change more broadly. Uh, one uh, was mentioned at the beginning, the OSF. If you go to osf.io, that's mostly what our organization does, is build and maintain this open source infrastructure to make it easy for researchers to manage their own research lifecycle. You create accounts, you have private projects, you add your collaborators to those projects, you register your studies so that you have a running record of all of them, you put all your protocols and your data and uh, IACUC and IRB materials, et cetera, et cetera. And then it makes it trivial if you want to make any of that stuff. So you're doing that all to, for your own lab or your own individual, your own collaborations, maintenance and archiving of your own work. Uh, but we make it trivial to make any parts of it public if you want to make it public. So you can be more transparent with the entire research process if you like. So that's all I'll say about the technology. Uh, but that's free and available for your use, so go use it. What I want to talk about mostly is the social parts, uh, because that's where the real interventions on actually getting full embrace uh, of the culture change. All of these rely on that base technology of the OSF, uh, but they are where it is we sort of meet uh, the challenges of uh, cultural norms and incentives. So the first one is just an easy uh, kind of intervention, which is if we think that people aren't sharing data or sharing materials or pre-registering their research because they don't see others in their community doing it, then let's increase the visibility of others in their community doing it. So the idea with these badges is to have journals that are interested in awarding those badges uh, say, this is an option. When you get your paper accepted at that journal, uh, the editor says, great, you're accepted. And if you like, and you meet the criteria for these, uh, for, for open data, you have to put in a repository. If you meet that criteria, then 
we will put this badge on your paper uh, and a link uh, to where your data are Same with materials Same with pre-registration. So for the author, this is a very small incentive, right? It's a badge, cares about badges. That's not a thing that we're, we're not in Girl Scouts. This is why would I care about a badge? Uh, but it is an acknowledgement of those behaviors for people who are early in the life cycle to do those behaviors, right? It signals to other people that I care about that as an author. The more critical function of the badges is the signaling function, is if people are doing that behavior, then by making it visible, it may help to start to shift to those norms because people will see, oh yeah, I know that's desired, but no one does it, but oh, now I see that others do it. Oh, I think it's really hard and I don't think I could do it for my kind of data. Oh, there are people in my community doing it. It starts to challenge some of the immediate assumptions uh, that are interferences with how people would do those behaviors. So an obvious question is, does that work? Uh, so yes, question. So pre-registration is the idea of uh, logging in advance of doing the experiment uh, that you're going to do the experiment and how you're going to analyze the data once you get it. So it serves two functions. One is to make sure that there is a record of every study that you did uh, so that if I do 10 studies and I only put two in the paper, you can at least discover the other eight. Uh, right? So that's just the basis of what's the overall amount of evidence. The second function of pre-registration is to make it visible when I analyze my data 15 different ways and only reported the one way it worked. With pre-registration, I can report to you at least the way that I plan to analyze it in advance to make it really clear the difference between the confirmatory tests that are diagnostic statistical inferences versus the exploratory work where the, the p-values, for example, if you use null hypothesis significance testing, no longer have meaning. Right? If I analyze the data 100 different ways and report to you the five ways it works, well, that's by chance, uh, not real. Uh, and so that's the function of pre-registration. Thanks for the question. OK, happy to talk about that more, too. Uh, all right, so we did uh, the first journal that adopted badges uh, did so on January 1st, 2014. And that's right here on this graph. What I'm showing you on the y-axis is the percent of articles in the journal that adopted it, Psych Science in black, and in four comparison journals in gray, uh, that reported having open data. And what is down here, too low for some of you, are what the journal's sharing rates, open data rates are before they adopted badges. So every six months, uh, the journals, a uh, proportion of the articles that had uh, open data. So Psych Science had about 3% of articles prior to 2014 had open data. They adopted badges January 1st, 2014, uh, and then it went like that. So within 18 months, Psych Science had 39% of the articles had open data. Uh, comparison journals showed no change uh, during that time period. Right? Just for that stupid little badge. Right? But of course it's not about the stupid little badge. Right? It's about what the badge signals. Open data is valued. People don't see others doing that. So why would I do it? Well, now I can see that others are doing it. Oh, maybe I should do it. Oh, more people are doing it. Oh, maybe this is a thing. Oh, everybody's doing it. I better do it. Right? The normative change can come by just increasing the visibility of those behaviors. This is mid-2015. In 2019, it's now about 75% uh, of articles uh, in psych science have open data. And this is for a field where not all data can be shared openly, right? A lot of it is sensitive human subjects data. Some of that can be anonymized so that they can still share it. Some parts can't. And so 70, 75% may be a ceiling on what's even possible uh, in uh, this particular subdiscipline. But the idea is that if the thing is already valued, it's actually not necessarily so hard uh, to get people to shift their behaviors if they see that others in their community are doing uh, that behavior. So that's one example that goes after the norms. A second example is coming back to some of the points that were raised in the earlier discussion, which is how do we change what the journals are expecting of us? Because that is a key incentive. We're not going to get rid of needing to publish uh, as an incentive very easily, and there could be lots of negative consequences for removing that entirely as a uh, criterion. So Registered Reports tries to do its intervention at how journals do their business. So here's the cartoon of research, right? You design a study, you collect and analyze the data, you write the report, and then you publish it. Of course, it's not that simple. There's this big barrier here, peer review, after you've written the report uh, before you get the publication. Now, in the current context, 
that peer review happens after all the research is done. And so all of the incentives for that report are make it as beautiful as possible so that eventually, at the third or the fourth or the fifth journal, the reviewers will relent uh, and allow it through to the promised land of publication. The, and so all of those issues that we talked about before of needing to have a story, needing to have a hypothesis presented as a test your hypothesis, reporting all data that's clean uh, is all focused on there. Registered reports makes one key change to the peer review process, and that is to move the first stage of peer review to here. So in a registered report, what you send to the journal is your research question, why it's important to study that question, some of your initial exploratory data maybe showing that this is a viable area of research, that you have some initial evidence that there's something here to investigate, and your methodology for the key study or studies that you're going to do to really test uh, that question. You haven't done the studies yet. The reviewers review the importance of that question and the quality of your methodology to test the question. And if it makes it through peer review here, then the journal commits to publishing it regardless of outcome. Then you do the research and you submit it again here and the review process at the normal time is not focused on are the results exciting, it's focused on did you do the experiments like you said you were going to do it? Did you screw up the study uh, in some way? Right? You're doing neural imaging study, you forgot to turn on the magnet. Sorry, we're not going to take it. Uh, so you still have to execute the work well, but you don't have to get any particular result. This change fundamentally changes the incentive dynamics for everybody in the system. However, I could argue that that's very labor intensive. So you could argue it's labor intensive, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll come back to that. It's a great point. So, so results blind. Yeah. Yeah. But the reviewers would focus on objective intent. Yeah. So they're so are we gonna learn something? Yeah, good. So I think that is parallel to what happens here in review. So can be so there's a there's something to follow up on in two slides about the matching between grant review process and this here. Uh, but the so let's return uh, to that part. But you're right, is that in this peer review at this stage, what we're that you may have a hypothesis, you may not. What you're justifying to get the commitment to publication is that what you're investigating is important and the methodology is a good methodology to test it, rather than focusing on the outcomes. So what happens for me as an author here is that my incentives are not get beautiful results, it's ask important questions and design compelling tests of those questions, right? rather than anything about the outcomes. As a reviewer, incentives change as well. <clears throat> When I get papers to review here, after looking how many times I've been cited, the second thing that I look at is whether the findings are consistent with claims that I've made in the past. And if they're consistent with my claims, then it is a great methodology. I'm sure I will recommend this for publication. Right? If it challenges my point of view, especially if it challenges my point of view by name, you can be sure that that methodology is terrible. And I will find the way that it is terrible so that I can say it should be rejected uh, for publication. Here, I don't know what the outcomes are. Right? So me and my biggest antagonist could be both peer reviewers of the same research. And we both have the same objective. Make sure that that research is the highest quality possible because I'm sure I'm right. And I want to show that I'm right. Uh, and so the review process changes. When I'm an author here and the reviewers point out everything that I did wrong, all I can do is feel bad because I'm done. I did the research already. And so I revise it hoping that the next reviewers won't notice so I can get the publication. When the reviewers point out what's wrong with my methodology here, I can say thank you because I can change my methodology to address their critiques so that I don't waste my time doing a bad study. Instead, I improve my methodology based on the reviewers' comments. So the couple things of what happens in, so there are now 238 journals that offer this. Uh, we have 
accumulated experience. We did a special issue of one journal in 2014 just to show proof of concept. Uh, and now we have accumulated a lot of data. There are a couple of interesting things to note anecdotally, and then I'll show you some specific data. One thing to, uh, uh, that's observed is publication, the rate of acceptance. So the concern about efficiency. This seems like it's a lot more laborious. Turns out, so far, uh, that it might be less laborious on the system overall. The reason is that publication acceptance rates here, when it's review is done here, is about 15%. Right, 20%, depends on the journal, but very low acceptance rates. Right? We have to send the same paper to multiple journals to finally get in. Here, so far, the acceptance rates are some, around 70 to 75%. And the reason, I think, uh, is that most ideas are promising enough that they could be improved. So the review process improves them, and it becomes much more collaborative between the reviewers and the authors, uh, getting that paper to be something that can be publishable. Uh, so on the aggregate, the system it actually reduces the load uh, on reviewers. Also, I'll, I'll note that reviewers love being part of this process. It's much more fun to be a reviewer, to be able to have an impact on the design and the questions, and then to see what happened. Oh, it's going to be so exciting uh, when we see what happens. Yeah, question. Yeah, so what's the difference between the journal and the grant process here? And the answer is almost nothing. And we're going to come back to that after two slides. So thank you for that. So let me give you a little bit more data about the outcomes from this, and then we'll come back to that. So first question is, does this actually address publication bias? Right? This emphasis on getting positive findings and finding support for all of our claims. The typical, this is the typical result, uh, which is in the normal literature, about 10% of the findings in this particular study were null results. 90% were positive findings, finding evidence for their claims. That's what happens in most of the literature. With registered reports from the same journals, uh, same kind of work, about 60% of the results are negative results, those final outcomes. Whether it's replications of prior research or novel studies, most of them are not finding support for the initial question or hypothesis in the paper. This is much more like what reality is because we've eliminated publication bias. We've committed in advance to publishing those regardless of outcomes. And so we're now seeing that reduction of publication bias and presumably have a much more credible literature as a consequence. Now, one challenge we have is that when we show these results to editors of journals that don't yet offer registered reports, a non-trivial minority of them say, that's why I won't offer registered reports at my journal. I don't want to have 60% of the findings in my journal be negative results. No one will ever cite them. And then I will be the one that ruined the impact factor of my journal uh, because th these are results that no one cares about. So whether we agree uh, with the emphasis on impact factor or not in that kind of decision making, it nevertheless is a reasonable question to ask. Are these, as a consequence, not very interesting so people don't use uh, that evidence. So we've looked at that uh, in the material that we've had, and others have looked at it in the, in the data that we have available so far. Uh, and what you're seeing here is analysis of three different data, citation databases, Google Scholar, Scopus, and Web of Science. And 100 would mean that registered reports and the comparison regular articles in the same journals published at the same time are, are cited the same amount. Above the line means the registered reports are cited more. Below the line, registered reports are cited less. So if anything, it's probably about the same uh, in the cumul accumulated data so far. So a question that uh, there, we don't have clear evidence for why, uh, but I have a strong speculation based on just observing uh, these. And that is that registered reports end up being better designed and more interesting to know the outcome, whatever it is compared to regular papers. And the reason is that if you have to commit to publishing this, regardless of outcome, then it means you really want to know what the outcome is. So this is an important question. We need to know what the result is. So of course, we're going to publish it either way, because a negative result is, in, is information, just like the positive result would be. And likewise, the fact that you have this review where other experts are helping improve the methodology means that you end up with better tests more informative uh, studies uh, with the registered report model compared to the reverse. 
So that's some of the uh, data. We have a number of other studies evaluating whether this is working as intended, but that's uh, some of the evidence. But I want to come back to the, oh, please. Well, we, so we have uh, registered reports as an option at eLife, uh, which is you know impact factor of 10 or something like that. Uh, nature human behavior, uh, it's coming out in two other nature sub uh, journals uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, nature nature, just one nature, uh, does uh, intend to adopt, but after getting experience with it with a number of the other subfield uh, journals. Uh, Yes, yeah. And that way, the, the, the higher end journals can sort of maintain their, we, we want to publish this or not. Right. So, so yes, that's certain. Pre registration in general is a much easier to implement because it doesn't have to be tied to any journal and is a good credibility signal that's milder uh, demand on the journals themselves for what they're committing to. The argument that we've made uh, with the journals that really care about their standing at the, at the top uh, is that they can set whatever bar they want. Uh, so science was very close to adopting. I think, I think we're still going to get there, and we're getting some of the, again, the sub-journals first. Uh, but, they, but the thing that resonated with the editor at the time for adoption was, look, you may set the bar so that only the test for Higgs boson is the one that would get through. That's fine, that's up to you. Whatever bar you need of, we really need to know the answer. Because the answer on Higgs boson, whether it was there or not there, was going to get published in science no matter what. Uh, so yeah, they can set a bar. So they still have complete control over what standard they want for do we need to know the answer and will we want to publish this regardless. Uh, so I think that addresses, it, it, it is effective in how they think about it. A very positive signal uh, for the commitment of journals uh, on this is that we have a, uh, we just submitted two weeks ago a proposal to NSF to run a randomized trial of registered reports. And we have, a bunch, we have a bunch of journals that have signed on to be part of that randomized trial. Uh, and the, so you're like, how do we do a randomized trial? It's very hard to think of it in the normal case. I'm not going to assign you to do a registered report for your research, and you have to do it in the control. Instead, we're doing it in those disciplines where it's not uncommon for in the process of review to be asked for another experiment. This is only a subset of disciplines where this happens, but it happens not irregularly in those disciplines where you say, it's great, it's great, but you need that one more uh, figure, uh, and then we'll publish it. That's where the randomization occurs. So the action letter is drafted. They want to ask for another experiment. Then they're invited and randomized into a registered report. They're going to get that last experiment reviewed in advance or just do it the normal way. Uh, and then we'll see if Register Reports has the impact. So a lot of journals are totally on board with that idea, including the biggies, uh, as they were. Cell was almost there, almost there, but they didn't, they didn't buy in. Uh, so we're going to get them on the next one. Uh, so there was another question. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a, a grant review process. Grant review process. Yes, I'm going to do that next. All right, so let's, yeah, let's come back to this. It's come up a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, so this is great. So the, 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 this changes the process at the journals to be much more like grants. And that occurred to us too in the same way, which is, wait, if these are very much the same thing, how about we make them one thing? And so we've done a few times a partnerships uh, between a journal and a funder who are interested in promoting this to have a single review process where if you get through the review and you succeed through the review, the funder funds it and the journal commits to publishing it. And nobody dislikes this. Right? Funders are persistently frustrated about the amount of research that they fund where they get zero return on investment. It's never reported anywhere. Right? Or they don't even know how much of it is never reported because they can't see what research has been completely finished. But lots of it's never published. So this gets them a commitment to whatever is found, it will get uh, into the literature. Journals like it 
because they're getting high quality funded research that's going to come to their journal. And authors say, you mean I have to submit once and I get the money and the publication? <laughs> Sign me up, right? And it's obvious, of course I'm going to do this. Uh, so the, this works incredibly well where it's been tried. So the one that's happening right now is in influenza research, uh, where the flu lab, the funder, uh, is, is partnered with PLOS uh, to do this. So you can submit a proposal. Uh, if it makes it through the proposal process, uh, flu lab will give the funding for the studies. Uh, PLOS will commit to publishing it. Yeah. So from the funder's perspective, they don't always know whether you didn't do the experiment in the first place or whether you did it and got negative results. So this right. one, at least, they, get, they, they also get, get some return on the investment. That's right. That's right. So the, the rate of results coming out is much higher. So Children's Tumor Foundation has done this a couple of times. And we also now have a, a grant under review to test this uh, with many different funders uh, signing on uh, to test this in their various communities. So we're hopeful uh, for that too, but it's expanding quickly because of exactly this thing. There's a potential efficiency gain uh, for everybody uh, on the review process. Uh, okay, where are we on time? I want to. Plenty of, I'll just keep talking. You're all here for the rest of the afternoon. Fantastic, thank you, Jim. All right, uh, so let me give uh, one uh, more example and then we'll wrap to close for uh, discussion. And that is thinking about the fact that these incentives aren't just for the individual researchers, they're also impactful on the other stakeholders in the community. And we anticipated uh, with the Register Reports example, the fact that journal editors have their own set of incentives and perceived risks, particularly around the prestige of their journal. And we know that journal impact factor is not a good indicator of the quality of the research, each individual article in those papers. Journal impact factor is a summary score of citation rates of the journal. Citations aren't necessarily indica direct indicator of quality as well. There's all sorts of reasons that, that nobody likes the journal impact factor. And Dora uh, has done a great job of articulating what are the problems with journal impact factor and why we should not be using it as a basis of assessment of individual researchers, of individual articles, and even journals not trying to use it for evaluation of the quality of their journal. It doesn't really indicate my quality. But it's hard to get away from that uh, because there aren't alternatives. There isn't another way for a journal to say we're a good journal. Uh, this thing keeps coming up. And even all of the one word journals are saying, no, 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 we don't care about journal impact factor anymore. But they really do. Right? They can't help but, uh, because it is the way, whether we like it or not, that we have some connection to the quality of that journal. So what we have been uh, focused on for editors and journals to try to break this is developing alternative metrics that are values aligned. And we just released last month topfactor.org. And this is based on the top guidelines. We developed these in 2015, Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines, which is a framework of eight policies for promoting transparency and reproducibility, data transparency, analysis transparency, uh, replication, et cetera. So there's these eight factors. And the top guidelines is a framework for journals to update their policies. Funders too, and I'm focusing here on journals. And the idea is that they can take the top guidelines and introduce policies that would then promote transparency and reproducibility in the research that they publish. And the way that they can implement it is scored, where they can get a zero to a three. A zero means they didn't implement the policy uh, for the data transparency. A, one, a score of one means that they require disclosure. So you don't have to share your data, but you have to say whether your data are publicly shared. And you have to say whether it is or it isn't, and if it is, where it is. A score of two uh, on that factor is data sharing is required. Unless you meet one of the exceptions criteria, right, sensitive information, proprietary information, uh, you have to post the data to a public repository. And a level three is we're, not only do you have to post it, we're going to check. We're going to reanalyze uh, your data and see if the findings in the paper correspond to the data uh, that you shared. So what top factor does is it takes the policies that journals have adopted. Now more than 1,000 journals have adopted top policies uh, for their journals uh, and makes a visualization of what their policies are so you can do easy comparison across journals uh, within different subfields or uh, on different factors uh, that you care about. Uh, and so what the, uh, what the key intervention for us is, is can we create a metric 
that's about things that journals can and should control, their policies and process for promoting transparency and reproducibility, and make it a metric that is a way to evaluate how the journal is doing uh, in some way. So this is a metric that rewards transparency and reproducibility. It is values aligned in that if they do these things, they're promoting things that actually promote the credibility of the research. And it's focused on things that the journals can and should control, rather than the citation of the outcomes that they publish, which incentivizes them to publish the most exciting, regardless of credibility. Uh, instead, that focuses them on run a good journal, have good policies, and have good process. So the, what we do then with those data is we use it as a normative intervention. So we can take the journals, uh, some initial set of journals that have very strong scores, and these are some of the strongest scores uh, the, on, on adoption of these policies. And then we can share them with the editors and say, oh, just wanted to make sure that we've got your, your uh, policies right, your, your scores right, here's what we found. And then science says, wait, 11? Wait, Nadine Bebe is 15? No, 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 no we, we are a little bit better than that. Okay, so and then they push up. And we're very happy to revise our score if they're willing to revise their policy. We released this five weeks ago. Uh, 31 Nature Journals updated their policies in the last four weeks. <laughs> it's not so hard to get these interventions when the data is available and comparative, especially when it's stuff that they would do if there was a good reason to do it, because it is values aligned. Uh, so these are high scoring ones. Uh, oh, and those are the policies. And there's lots that have zeros, lots and lots uh, that have no policies at all. So those ones are really fun to email because we say, oh, you said you care, you signed the top guidelines, for example. You said you care about these things. We don't see uh, your policies haven't been changed. And here are some comparison journals in your field that have changed their policies. Just thought you'd want to know. Um, so this is a mechanism to then give them that same sort of normative uh, influence for updating their policies. OK, so let me, let me uh, wrap uh, so that well, we can talk more. I've, on, I talked about a couple of examples, particularly focused on uh, publishing, about the challenges uh, for the incentives and norms landscape for, those, for the researcher, making decisions about how they can succeed and do the best work that they can. The values are there, but the incentive systems around them are not always aligned with that. And the real challenge with social change in science is that it's decentralized. Right? Each individual researcher has a unique combination of institution, publishers that publish their work, societies uh, of which they're members, and funders that support their work. And if we can't align the incentives and norms and policies across those, then it's going to be very difficult uh, for that person to navigate that in a way that's values aligned. And so the key role is solving the coordination problem. Uh, of getting all of these different actors uh, to shift uh, in concert uh, toward making sh the system be reinforcing uh, for those individual actors uh, making the decisions that they make. So that's a lot of the work of uh, the culture change effort uh, involves. There is, I'm gonna skip that just for time, uh, but just to close on a positive note of, boy, yeah, that's, that's a big challenge. There's lots of things uh, that are hard to change in cultures. Culture change is hard. Uh, but there are lots of indicators uh, that the last six years have been, uh, there have been lots of progress because there's many, many different people across many different stakeholder communities that are invested in making these changes happen. Uh, and there's lots of indicators of that. I'll use the ones that are most available to me, which is just adoption of our technology, the OSF, uh, as illustration of this. So this is, we launched the OSF in 2012. This is just the number of registered users uh, by year. Uh, you can see it's growing non-linearly. We just passed 200,000 uh, earlier this year uh, using the OSF. They are registering studies uh, with dramatic growth, uh, more than 36,000 uh, now uh, in 2019. Uh, they, you can use the OSF to run uh, a preprint service to share data uh, uh, reports more quickly and more openly uh, with others. Uh, lots of different communities run their own preprint services on the OSF. 26,000 papers have been shared. Likewise, just in 2019, 2.8 million files were posted to the OSF, a million of those publicly posted. And it's not just going there to die. People are going to the OSF and using uh, that information. So this is a yearly unique visitors uh, to the OSF. More than 2 million people uh, went to the OSF to look at things uh, in 2019, downloaded uh, 16 million files 16 million uh, times. 
So there's lots of use uh, with these tools and lots of growth and change happening across disciplines, but it really is also a very small part uh, of a very large challenge. And so any effective solutions are going to require that continuing coordination across us, uh, all of us uh, that have interests in trying to promote as much transparency and reproducibility as possible in the work that we do to maximize the credibility of the claims that we wind up with. So I will end with that. Uh, there's some links here if you want more information about any of the things I talked about. It's also a link to the slides themselves because we wouldn't be open science if we didn't share the slides. So if you take a picture, you can find uh, these slides and do with them what you will. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we booked uh, a room for follow-up discussion and discussion with a good news is we're not being kicked out of this room. So I suggest that we just Anybody who wants to continue this discussion, just stay here, keep eating food, and we're gonna keep talking to Brian. So, uh, so right. we'll open up the questions first before we start a small discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, then I will start. So, so um, thinking about your ecosystem, right? And get my, getting my faculty promoted, right? Since I'm too old. So, um, if you, if you submit a grant application, the study section will look at the number of papers you have with your name numbers first and last. They may not care much about your impact. If you submit, so that's fine. So if, you, if, you're, if the journals are publishing more papers with negative data, that's good for a grant application. You got more data. If the PNT committee will also look at the number, they're going to look at the impact factor. Yeah. So if your journal is publishing more negative data and your impact factor may decline, um, that may not necessarily work for the promotion pending committee if that becomes important. But the journals are, and the journals care about the impact factor as well, right? So is there a new, can, can you convince everybody to use a different factor and jettison the impact factor in, in favor of a open science factor or something that yeah. just turns out to be a better indicator? Of, yeah, uh, it, it's a great question. And a big challenge that we have, of course, is that no heuristic is really sufficient to capture the quality of the actual research. Uh, that uh, there are indicators that might give us some information. We know that impact factor of the journal is not a very good indicator of individual quality of research. So there are big challenges there. And we do need some heuristics to be able to start engagement. And so that's part of the goal of top factor is let's give an alternative metric for the journal at least to value. And uh, review committees could value that as well. Did you submit to a journal and publish that in a journal that has good policies and practices rather than high impact? But I think the intervention at the PNT uh, committee is, is slightly different in the current context uh, rather than focusing on an alternative metric that they can use at a heuristic. And the reason I think it's a bit different is because PNT can spend the time on the quality of that researcher's work rather than just looking at their CV. Hiring is hard. There's 250 applicants. How are we going to winnow that down? Uh, but an easier one is PNT, which is we're going to look at this person closely. So I use this example when I have time uh, for my own uh, promotion case uh, here in the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, and it's just to illustrate, I think, the challenge that we have. I have been on promotion tenure committees, uh, and, and my perception of them in general at UVA is that they're very good, uh, really rigorous, really look at the quality of the work. I think where UVA doesn't do as well is in how it communicates the signals that it sends to the faculty about what is actually valued in that process. And this is an illustration of that, which is when I was going up for a full professor, the administrator in my department said, please print out all your articles and submit them to the committee. I print them out, first of all. Come on. Uh, but this is full professor. I had 100 articles. So what are you going to do, weigh them? Like, it is a ridiculous thing to request, because there's no way the committee is going to deal with those. Right? So it is exactly the wrong signal, because what it tells me is that volume is what matters. Right? What they could have done is when I walked in the door in the Department of Psychology, they said, what's going to happen in six years when you go up for tenure, or for a full after that, is you're going to submit three papers to the committee. You choose which three, but you're going to submit three, and the committee's going to read them, and they're going to get the external letter writers to read them, and we're going to evaluate the quality of your work based on what you say is your best work. 
And that's going to be the basis, not this. I can see this on your CV. We're going to actually read it too. If I had known and had that in my mind when I walk in the door, how I orient to what it is to be successful at UVA would have been fundamentally different than thinking, I'm just going to get the wheelbarrow and dump it in the, in the office. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I like the alt metrics movement a lot for exactly the reason uh, as Jim raised, which is we need some alternatives to just looking at journal impact factor. And the donut is one step towards that, which is how much attention is this work getting in the media and right. social media conversation, et cetera. And that is information, uh, and it has some value. It doesn't tell you about quality, right? So the, the most cited, the, it promotes, an, exactly. And in fact, the, the highest scoring altmetric uh, paper ever is one of these crazy ones where it's like about whether people can eat dog poop or something like this, right? It's a, it's a crazy thing that caused a social media storm is how is this ever published? And of course, that's the one that wins because everybody's talking about how crazy this is. Uh, so it's just to illustrate that it is, it's about a certain thing. And if you know what it's about, then you can evaluate it in that context. Uh, it would be nice to have other indicators of impact that are about the things that we actually care about what the work will do. And the hard part is that most of those are not easily quantitative. Right? How do we translate whether this therapy was, it's only cited five times, but look how many lives it saved. Uh, and for a, popu you know, a population of only 500 people have this disease, it saved 300 of their lives. Right? I mean, okay. That's worth tenure. <laughs> I think that's worth tenure, right? Whatever it is. So that's the real challenge. Yeah. So if you have another metric in addition to the impact factor, the number of citations you get for a paper, you're regardless of the impact of the yeah. That's not ideal either, but at least it shows how people are paying attention to your work. What I'm really getting at is if there were more papers published with negative results, that might be something I would want to know about in the site. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, point, uh, is that one of the challenges we have of an environment where only positive results are valued is that we end up doing lots and lots of redundant work that we already know as a field are dead ends, but we haven't shared. Uh, and so the opportunity that we have is exactly as you describe. Here is the context of the work that my team is doing. Some obvious paths to go would be X, Y, and Z, and here are the 30 citations saying those are not going to be worthwhile paths to go. And that's why we're doing this. It may seem like low likelihood, but it is the next kind of thing to do, whereas all the high likelihood ones, right? The amyloid hypothesis, dominating, 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 Alzheimer's, uh, may be persisting partly because people don't really recognize how much negative data there is uh, for that. So I think you're exactly right, is that these, these can have um, uh, produce a virtuous cycle that by making the negative data available when it's compelling research uh, makes it more citable in order to not keep repeating uh, the past mistakes. I think that's right on target. So, yeah. So thinking about having more negative results, if you correlation the So yeah, so that's a potential concern is that by now publishing negative results, since that's most of our results, now we just have more stuff. Uh, so a couple of thoughts about that. One is that the literature is already for any individual effectively infinite. Uh, so adding infinity to infinity, I think is still infinity. Uh, so that, as I recall my math uh, course, right? So in that regard, who cares? Keep it all coming. But of course you're right in the sense that what, do, what the current culture, regardless of negative results, what the current culture needs is better filter mechanisms. 
right? And the improvement of filter mechanisms to getting me the data and information that is actually relevant to me that I need uh, is the thing that needs to be solved. The solution of let's suppress, systematically suppress a certain kind of results, negative results, to have the literature that I can access be less credible is not a good solution because it's counterproductive in that if we only see the positive results, we believe there's more credibility in the current literature than there actually is. And so we, it's impossible uh, to get to an accurate estimation of what the real effect there is. That's po it's interesting. It's possible that would occur. My guess is that the neg and this is entirely speculative, is that the rate of negative results would increase over time, uh, because the more that we understand about an area of research, the less the the questions that remain are more complex questions. Right? They're moderated factors. They're all of the things that are. Uh, now the main effects are done, and now we're looking for how it works differently in these different situations. And so that's where I think a lot of negative results tend to come up, but that's totally speculative. What I think can happen in models like registered reports is on the question of volume of literature, is right now, because quantity is rewarded so much, people are just pushing stuff through, if we're making decisions in advance on this will be published, then I don't have to focus on quantity to the same degree. I can focus on making sure I get good quality papers that get that pre-commitment to publication. And then I have the publication. The students, a lot of graduate students have tried out registered reports and have reported it as releasing the pressure in a major way for compared to how they feel in doing their work in the regular way. Right? They, get, they, they have the publication. They just have to focus on doing it well now, and rather than running 20 experiments and trying to get two that work and reporting those. And so I think we will end up actually recalibrating the pace uh, that we need to work by rewarding the work in, the, in a better way. So that's a great question. So, I'm, so about the, the other thing that came to mind for me is, how do you avoid having the reviewers have more of a vested So uh, it's, it's a good question. They will, so there's a couple of things that happen with reviewers in this context. Uh, one is that they have the positive buy-in uh, in that they are providing feedback and they're excited to help improve uh, the research. Uh, it, in the ANIC data experience so far, uh, reviewers are very likely to come back in the second phase because they're excited to find out what happened too uh, and provide that second uh, stage of review. There's also the possibility that they will engage in dysfunctional ways at the outset, right? You're my competitor. I see that you've come up with this idea that I think is great, and now I want to do that before you do. Uh, and I'm a reviewer of that. And so I'm going to try to undermine your work so that I can get it. Uh, that can happen in the same way that right now it can happen in the grant review process. And there are strong norms against it. It's, it's, a, it's a misconduct. Uh, and so we're not going to solve in a lot of these, the potential for misconduct, what we can do is improve the transparency of detecting misconduct uh, when it occurs. And so one of the advantages that registered reports or pre-registration has is that it, it certifies that you had that idea and when you had it. Uh, so you submit it and you have it registered on this date, that that's when you came up with the idea, and then I try to scoop you. Uh, well, it's detectable that I came later uh, in terms of when that work started. That's complicated, but there's there's a lot still to learn uh, in how that all emerges. Yeah. So do we? This is a science question, not a business question, because I, re I recognize the answers will probably be very different. But do we? Can we get to a point, or should we, where we don't need the journals anymore, where we all labs essentially pre-register their reports, they report the results of their findings, and everybody kind of links to each other's work in a social media-ish kind of way, and Reviewers are replaced by commenting on the, on the work and on the design yeah. and things like that. And the journals are just kind of unnecessary. Yeah, great question. Uh, I have a, a paper series called Scientific Utopia. Uh, and the first one, the conclusion at the end, it sort of walks through how we could get to utopia, is that there's, if there is a journal, there is one. And it's just all of the literature. Uh, so I think uh, we likely have a resonance in how we might think about uh, 
at least in idealistic terms, how that might happen. Uh, the, what the question prompts, I think, is us to think about what is the role of a journal in the scientific communication process. And historically, it had a couple of functions. Right? Historically, it provided some peer review, although that's a, actually a relatively recent invention at journals. And it had an, a filtering function, right? having a theme uh, that this journal provides. And so people know if I apply, if I subscribe to that journal, I'll get stuff that I care about versus that journal. Uh, and a dissemination function, uh, which is, I how are we going to get all this research? We don't have the internet in the 1960s, so we need to be mailing it out to each other. The dissemination function is no longer relevant for journals. It's easy to disseminate our findings now. You post it up on the web, and then it's, people get it. The uh, filtering function has some role, but there's lots of ways that we filter stuff now. Right? Look at the diversification of news media. We have lots of different ways that are outside of the way you think about a journal to think about how it is you figure out what's worth reading. Right? A lot of scientists who use Twitter will use Twitter for this purpose. It's no longer through a journal. It's following people that do work related to me and seeing what they talk about for me to discover what I want to think about. Uh, and then the last one, the peer review, does it need to be done through a journal or can it be done through other mechanisms? Commenting or more open uh, kinds of peer review that aren't tied to a particular publisher or a particular journal. And the, what's exciting is that there's a lot of different companies or communities that are testing out the limits of that. Uh, so it's still very nascent uh, of how far we can go with peer review outside of a typical journal system. But I think the innovation there is, is very interesting uh, to see how far it could go. Because it, I think there could be a massive reorganization of how we think about scholarly communication uh, based on how well those tests go. So thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing that I noticed when you come to top journals, yeah. um, the thing that caught my eye was the publishers. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, like, oh, the dissemination function. You don't need it to have the internet, like, unless the journal is, you know, provide you like it, unless yeah. you have to subscribe to it if it's not open access, right? So I was yeah. wondering if um, you've noticed any um, you know, correlation between the journals who are really interested. Yeah. Uh, society yeah, great question. So the interesting thing with their experience with top guidelines is that we've had the most positive engagement with the big publishers, Elsevier, Taylor & Francis, Wiley, Springer Nature, uh, compared to groups like, not, not to, you know, like ACS has been harder, American Chemical right. Society, just as an example. Uh, they've been enthusiastic. They've had me come and speak and everything else, but been slower uh, than the big uh, journals. So the one answer of why, I think, uh, is that a lot of what we're trying to promote in transparency is not endangering their business model. It's not about open access to the paper. It's about sharing the data. They're not planning to make data proprietary. Uh, so there's a lot of parts of this where they could be good actors. And I think a lot of publishers want to be good actors. They just also want to make lots of money. Uh, and so the dimensions where they can be good actors without threatening the business model are places where they're willing to take proactive steps. And so that's been a positive. It's been more challenging with the society journals in some places, in part, I think, because a lot of the decision makers there aren't really thinking about scholarly communication and the business models. They're, they're often the academics who have a role there. And so they don't tend to think in as professionalized ways uh, as the major publishers do. And so it, just, it requires a bit more navigation uh, of those conversations. Now, of course, we have like the preprints and stuff. We're making everything green OA. The big publishers don't particularly love that. But they recognize that, that is, that's coming. Uh, and they're not going to be able to stop that. And they're adapting their business models to be more services oriented than uh, subscription, all stuff that's very familiar. Um, so they're, they're way ahead of the game, whereas the scientific societies, I think, because they're not thinking about this in business terms, are not at all there yet. They don't know how to adapt. And so it's a very tense time, I think, for uh, particularly societies that are highly dependent uh, on their journal revenue uh, for thinking about how to adapt, uh, because they're, they're five years behind. Uh, Elsevier knew what it was going to do in 2013. Uh, 
that others aren't thinking about it. It's a hard one. Yeah, yeah, this is a real challenge, and we see lots of problems with uh, misinformation in the present age and how easily these services can, the social media services can take advantage of that. Uh, bad actors can take advantage of that, and particularly thinking about areas of research that are controversial. Right? Research on abortion, if it were entirely open, would surely be overwhelmed with people that have passionate views of whatever kind about abortion uh, rather than so seemingly dispassionate research inquiry about those things. Uh, so that is a real risk with an entirely open review system. So most of the models that talk about open review uh, engaging in some of these, uh, these ways would have a barrier to entry, but it would be a modest barrier. So for example, having an ORCID, uh, the identifier that is an academic identifier, uh, it's, it, it, people can get it that aren't academics, uh, but uh, having that, requiring to have an identifier like that of I am in a society or at an institution of higher learning uh, can be a mechanism for providing as much openness as possible without getting overwhelmed uh, by the masses. Also having it be public so that you have to be identified versus allowing anonymous commenting is a mechanism for trying to address some of that. And then having systems that evaluate the evaluators is a mechanism for managing some of the misbehavior that can occur in social media. None of that has worked out, but there's lots of attention to those issues, especially among the companies uh, that have been worrying about this, you know, Facebook, Reddit, and others, that are working on how is it that you manage systems so that the, the good stuff comes through and the bad stuff doesn't. Uh, there aren't good answers, but there's a lot of interesting tests happening. Yeah, so we love promoting preprints because we like disrupting uh, this part of the system. Uh, and we think that this is a real opportunity to, um, for one, the long-term aim is that green OA is a much cheaper solution uh, than other forms of open access. So our approach is just get people to share whichever version of the paper they can share so that anybody can access it. And then wherever they publish it is where they publish it. And at scale, it becomes very hard to justify a subscription uh, model uh, when all of the papers are accessible, even though they're not as pretty uh, as you might like. Uh, there's also cool tools being developed to make them pretty uh, without requiring the journal intervention. Uh, so that's a, a general strategy. But in terms of the review uh, part of the process, there's um, one example is a group called Peer Communities In, PCI. Uh, this is a grassroots group uh, that has uh, launches peer reviewer communities in different subdisciplines. It started in ecology, but it has now 15 or so fields. Uh, and they use preprints. So they look for preprints, uh, and they do peer review on it. They post their peer reviews on their website, which is not a journal, uh, but they just post the reviews. And what model they're trying to develop is that authors can then use those reviews at a journal. So they develop partnerships with journals to use their reviews for making the review process more efficient. So journals just then have to say, OK, publish it, rather than sending out to review again. So this is just one of those kinds of tests where if we think of each of the part of the scholarly communication and evaluation process as a service of its own, then we can think about separating them into different services. So do we need a publisher? A publisher, as we think about it now, is the, all of the services bundled together. I submit. They get reviewers, they do the copy editing, they do the typesetting, they do the dissemination. Preprint service, well, it's published. I really want mine to look beautiful, and I'm, I'm not a really good writer, so maybe I'll pay you to do the copy editing, maybe I'll pay them uh, to do the typesetting, and maybe I'll pay that service uh, to do the review. Right? And each of those could be now a competitive marketplace of how much does it cost to do that thing, rather than all being bundled uh, in journals. So paying, just paying, breaking that paying open. Paying for the review sounds a little bit. Paying for reviews. Paying for reviews sounds dicey. Yeah, so this is interesting. Come back to me and pay me a second time if 
I give you a nice review of the first one? Yeah, right. So there, here's interesting things is where, yeah, what are the consequences of now different kinds of incentives, right? In an entirely open marketplace, right, where everyone's using preprints, you can publish whenever you want. Now I need legitimate peer reviewers to become legitimate, right? The reputational stakes are not, I just need to get through the peer review system. Every, anybody can publish. It's no big deal to put something on a preprint server. How do I get status? I need peer review that is seen as legitimate. So sure, I could pay you and pay you every time, but now they'll be, people will be able to see we're a cabal. I pay you, you give me a good review. Uh, and that doesn't help me. Whereas if there's an independent service that has its own legitimacy, its reputation, my reviews from them become transferred to me in terms of reputational stakes. So there are ways to work the, in the system to, as long as it's transparent. Right? Lack of transparency, it's all done, right? Because our cabal, no one knows. But if it's transparent, then it, it, it can work. I won't say it will work. It can work. <laughs> yeah. What is your recommendation for educating our next generation of researchers in this, knowing that their mentors don't buy it in? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we're asking their mentors to mentor them in research who would say, yeah, we're not going to make that <laughs> Yeah, it is a challenge, uh, and um, psychology is a few years ahead of this for, compared to other disciplines because started wrestling with this in multiple ways. I'm happy to sit. Um, so, um, and this this is declining as a concern, uh, and it's in part declining as a concern because once it achieves critical mass, it becomes very hard to not do the behaviors, and another. Uh, a function is that as it, these things become more popular, you have uh, more areas of support as a uh, early career researcher rather than just your PI. So you can, you know, just like uh, some cancer treatments, triangulate the lasers, right? You can triangulate the attack on the PI. Maybe that's the wrong analogy. Uh, <laughs> get rid of the cancerous PI. Uh, so okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, but it is a difficult challenge. Uh, and so what we have, uh, in just in many different conversations with people, how they're wrestling with this locally, uh, have seen that a lot of the soft cell starts are effective with uh, PIs, particularly PIs that are recalcitrant for whatever reason. And one of them that seems particularly good uh, is called reproducibility, T-E-A at the end. So it's journal club about reproducibility. Uh, where the, reading some of the popular papers that have come out about what are the transparency and reproducibility challenges in the, paper, in, in the field. And there's a lot of literature now. And those papers, as an ongoing discussion group, are effective at getting people to engage with these issues intellectually. And a lot of the papers talk about what are the solutions practically. Uh, and so it is a... A, a reasonable way to start to onboard uh, people who have some misgivings, some very legitimate misgivings too, uh, as one of the soft cells. Another is to make sure you have a diverse set of collaborations and collaborate with some people who are more progressive in how they think about it uh, so that you can get some of the experiences uh, with other parts of the community. Thanks. So for the CPSA, for I Thrive, right, we represent three Institutions. Um, and we are just School of Medicine here. We're not all of UVA. Nevertheless, um, we have to promote sound and rigorous. And we think you convinced us, I think, that open science falls under the general rubric of sound and rigorous. So, um, can you give us a win? If there, you can give us more than one, but if you could give us one effort, right? One objective that we should try to achieve to get us closer to that, um, what, would you, what, what would you think? As an institution or among the research activities? Do we want to change the way the p and committee yeah. works? Or, I mean, is there, is, you can ask, it's going to be a stepwise yeah. evolution of the, of the culture, but is there, a, is there one win that we could sort of target in the near term? Yeah, that's a good question. So let, let's go with the p and just because I think that's the, that's the in some ways, it's the hardest nut to crack. Uh, and, that's the first step. And if that's the 
<laughs> there is not, right. Well, there are some easy steps, I think. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly, right. Uh, so there are some easy first steps to solve the hard nut. Uh, and that is that what is unknown at almost every institution is whether the values that they intend to have for making decisions about PNT are what is perceived in the community and what is done in practice. So the first step, I think, is to, one, articulate the values. And maybe that step's already done. Like, how is it that we want to evaluate on PNT? Do we want to use impact factor of the journals? Well, let's be explicit about it. If we're saying, yeah, yeah, we're bought in on impact factor, then be clear about it. Uh, because if it's not clear what the expectations are, then the research community will just fill in their assumptions. Must be volume. They're not, they're not saying. Must be that I just need to produce a lot, right? All of these problems. So make the values explicit. Second step would be survey the tenure track research community and tenure community for that matter of what they perceive as the values and what it takes to get promotion and tenure at that institution, right? Is there a match? Do, so let's say, let's just imagine it's that the institution says we value, we value rigor, we value quality, we don't care about volume once you get below, below, above this minimum. Right? You gotta produce something, but as long as you're above this minimum, that, that's not the consideration. What we care about is quality, and this is how we want to evaluate it. And then survey people and say, is that what you perceive the institution cares about? If there's a mismatch there, there's an obvious intervention to address, which is, getting those aligned, but there's a third factor, which is which one of them is right, right? Because the institution might say these are our values. People say, no, that's not the institution's values. And so you, there, what is, there's very little of is evaluation of the data. Let's look at the last 10 years of PNT cases, and can we estimate how much an influence uh, the quantity of publications, the quantity of grant dollars, the impact factor of the journals published in predicted the outcome. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer a, a, slightly, a slightly different thing. So yeah. as far as one like thing. So when you sit in the PNP committee, you know that there's a checklist, right? So um, if you're just gonna think about research, the number of publications, the number where you're first or last author, right? Duration of uninterrupted, federal funding, impact factor of the journals, right? Consistency, are they sort of all focused in one area or they say, you know, so it's not just like, if you have 100 publications, you're in, but rather there's a, there is a menu. Yeah. If we could get the University of Virginia, start small, University of Virginia School of Medicine to add to that checklist, open science. We value open science in the in the publication. So it's not you're not taking impact factor off, you're not taking the focus off, you're not taking anything else off, but you're adding another consideration. And so now when they sit around and they're looking at somebody, they say, oh, and especially if there's somebody who's sort of, well, you know, and they're arguing yes, yes, no, the person has made a significant contribution to open science and is, you know, registered reports is right there on the thing. The letter from the chair and the department PT committee says, you know, this person has been, you know, a leader in this area, practicing here for the last three years, and it adds value to the person's promotion. I would think that would get us one notch closer. And I would say that that's consistent with what we say, right? Which is not necessarily publication, it's peer reviewed and disseminated. So you can have this okay. there, that's what's supposed to be valued, right? So if you put them out in open source and they're Peers that are sharing it in 
because I need the publication. <laughs> Could those start with the dean? I mean, because the, yeah. the policy that's on the on the web yeah. for you know research faculty professor or whatever it is that you know this is that this is valued by the PMD committee. It's right on there. Right. And then then you see it. And then it's up to the chair of the committee and the people on the committee to actually operationalize that value. But if it's actually written in there that this is valued by this institution. And then we can hard. capture the early adopters and the late adopters. We can watch the culture change. And then we're a model for the country, right? Which is what we've argued all along. That yeah. the work that you're doing should be a model for the country to evolve, the academic community to evolve. And as our dean, does our dean? I don't know. Appreciate your yeah, I don't know. No, uh, no. The the culture is is well. I should say it differently. This is and this is just observational. I I haven't looked at the data. I really want access to the data uh, to see how decisions are made. Uh, but my perception is that the the decision process is quite rigorous on quality. What I think falls down is that the that focus on quality and how those decisions are made is not known or internalized or believed uh, by junior faculty. Uh, and so that communication gap is a big problem, right? You might have the best process in the world, but if everybody thinks what I need to do is get three nature papers, it doesn't matter what your policy is, because that's what they think they need to do to succeed. So we don't even know if our dean knows what this is. So we can start there. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's our next step, is to sell the dean on this, and then, the dean, and then, so then step two is to actually convince him that he wants to formally incorporate it into the Somebody sit around the table and say, from now on, it AIF is, is going to be a thing? It was generated to help librarians decide what to subscribe to. Librarian. Right. And like many metrics, it became a thing well beyond what its in intended use was for. Not the right question. But if we want to have something formal, it's getting the 
promotion of policies revised. But that doesn't do it if the chairs who are trying to get their faculty, in the front of my faculty, the chairs who are trying to get their faculty promoted don't know what it is. And the faculty don't know what it is. <laughs> it's an open science thing. Right. So yeah, it does have to move forward. And, uh, the same so Jim, you're actually speaking to all the chairs next week and the dean in a public yeah, right. forum. <laughs> and maybe we could alter the topic a little bit to consider whether there's some opportunity to open the discussion of this. Strategic to ask him while he's being filmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what an outstanding opportunity. <laughs> Any other messages for us? Uh, I think you're off. You know, this, well, we could do a whole other lecture on implicit bias. Uh, but no, I, the, the, I think the conversation that you're having is the right conversation to have, which is how is it that we identify what it is we want? How do we measure to the extent we're doing it? And how do we make sure that everybody understands collectively that that is what we strive for as an institution? And I think those three pieces are the key pieces uh, for institutional the change. Council of Deans, have you been invited to the Council of Deans? I have not. Yeah, that's a place. That's a great place. We're all in the Deans to double AMC. Yeah. 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 Yeah.